Hey YouTube, it's Weird Paul. I am celebrating 30 years since I released my third album on February 6th, 1989. So let's take a look back at the making of Now I Blow My ABCs. In May of 1988, I'd released my second album, I Need a Pencil Sharpener. In the months afterwards, I graduated high school, got my first job, bought over a hundred vinyl record albums, and had my first live concert. By August, I was thinking about recording my next album. I made a list of 15 songs that were partially to completely written. On October 9th, 1988, I said during a live radio interview that my new album would be called Dictionary for Harold. The first one is called First Stomach of a Cow. Okay. And that is going to be on my next tape as soon as I finish it. Yeah. Which is going to be called Dictionary for Harold. Okay. My idea was that the tape would have 26 songs, one for each letter of the alphabet. I would soon find out what a challenge it would be to have all of the songs start with the correct letters. I had to put recording the album on hold because in November I left for recording school. While attending the recording workshop in Chillicothe, Ohio, I learned a lot about how to make my songs sound better, and I met my friends Tom and Steve, who wrote some songs with me and showed me some new viewpoints on songwriting. I got back from school on December 21st, and on December 26th, I started recording the album. Initially, I had some problems. I was recording using two tape decks with a Radio Shack mixer between them. One of the tape deck's motors was running slower than the other, which occasionally made things sound a little out of tune. But aside from some drum tracks, I had the whole thing recorded in just 12 days. For the first time, I'd made a list of all the songs that included exactly what tracks each one needed to finish them. I got the idea for the first song, Airport, on June 13, 1988. I had just graduated high school, so I had a concert to celebrate, but no one showed up for hours. Eventually I got hungry, and I tried to make a frozen pizza, but I didn't cook it long enough. It wasn't edible. After a while, our friend Christine showed up. She saw a whole bunch of bees flying into a hole into my parents' porch steps. She said, it's like an airport. I said, it's a bee's nest, let's get out of here. But that inspired the song that I wrote between November and January. Originally my A song was Abacus, but that ended up the next year on my fifth album, My Last Tape. Yeah, we're gonna get a hamburger at the airport. I got my family and friends to sing on airport, and I started it off with an airplane sound effect. My B song was Butthead something I wrote in July when messing around on the Casio keyboard. Butthead. I also wanted to do another version of my song, Blackout, so I had to make letter B a medley. It was the Aerosmith version. I needed the Walk This Way drum beat, so I just used the beat from Run DMC's version. My C song was Could We Be So Bored. This song was written about hanging out with Tom and Steve in the trailer, and how I had more fun being bored with them than doing stuff on my own. I wrote it on November 27th, while Tom and I were watching the TV show Almost Grown. We recorded it on December 5th, right after watching Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Steve played the guitar solos, and Tom threw stuff, including a banana. It was one of three songs that I made a music video for on February 4th. The D song was Dreaded Glaucoma Test. It was originally just called Glaucoma, but I changed it to use the letter G for a different song. On March 18th, I was in gym class. We were doing a basketball exercise called the Star Drill. I got hit in the head with a basketball and knocked my glasses off, bending the frames. A couple weeks later, my dad took me to Lens Crafters for new ones and he was determined that I would not need a glaucoma test. When they said that I would need it, we left and went to Pearl Vision Center, where they gently explained to him that it would only take two seconds. While we waited for the glasses, my dad and I wrote the song. I wrote the first verse, and he wrote the second one. On September 15th, my drummer, Ed Agogo, was over. We were practicing for our upcoming gig. 
I was trying to write a parody of the Elvis song, Jailhouse Rock, called Mailman Rock. But that never happened because Ed immediately changed it and wrote his own parody. I disliked it, but he persuaded me that it was funny, and he immediately called a friend to read it to them over the phone. I called the song Elvis because I already had a song that started with the letter J. The F song was First Stomach of a Cow. My friends Chris and Kurt came over on June 30th to jam. Chris brought his bass and Kurt brought his snare drum, so I gave him a Quaker Oats container so he could keep the beat. When I played back the recording, I found that the tape recorder had malfunctioned and sped up the tape at times. I needed a name for this strange instrumental. Near the end of July, my sister and I were playing the Game in a Book Trivia Quest. One of the questions was, name the cow's first stomach. My response was, I have no idea. Briefly, I called the song Second Stomach of a Cow, but I needed S to be a different song. Both First Stomach of a Cow and the next song, George Burns, had to be cut down for the album. They were both much longer originally. George Burns was eight minutes. I wrote it on April 24th. I just suddenly started singing and telling stories about George Burns while I played a repetitive progression on the Casio keyboard. I did it for an hour and a half straight. George Burns, I wanna play my Atari George Burns. What the hell is Atari George Burns? I thought the music sounded familiar. My sister's music teacher told her that it was the same as the 1930s Hoagie Carmichael song, Heart and Soul. But she said it was okay because everyone uses those chords. After I edited the original eight minute version down to five minutes, I taped over it. So it doesn't exist anymore. The H song, Hate, was originally called I Hate You, but I changed it because I needed the letter I for another song. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I had written it way back in December of 87, and it was supposed to be on my second album, I Need a Pencil Sharpener, but it got bumped off at the last minute by the song, It's a Choice. And then there's the I Got the Tap rap. On June 27th, 1987, my dad had a party at our house. He went out and bought a keg of beer. When he opened the keg, I took the lid and put it on a string, and I wore it around my neck. And then I started playing with the tap, and he yelled at me. This is for my I Got the Tap rap. Okay, here we go. You ready? I wrote the first verse in October, and then my friend Steve helped me with the rest in December while I was at recording school. I recorded it on New Year's Day 1989, and the lousy scratching that you hear on it was done by me. You're fresh, but I think you're scaling on the tap. Oh, 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 oh. I got the tap. You gonna rap? I got the tap. You gonna rap? Rock. I did it on a small portable record player, using the album Old Crest on a New Wave by Dave Mason. My eye song would have been I'd Like to See the Brain Specialist, a song that my sister and I recorded, but it got replaced. In the mid-80s, I watched a Christian music program called Light Music on a UHF channel. It was hosted by the now-deceased Tom Green, a local musician known for the catchphrase, Well, hi! He sometimes wore a bag over his head. We would film our own parodies of his program, and during one of these on October 5th, 1987, we made up a little song. A year later, I was walking in downtown Pittsburgh to the record store, and a guy handed me this. That's when I decided that Jesus is Lord should be on the album. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. The next song is the shortest one. Kindness Kills clocks in at just 15 seconds. On October 29th, 1988, I was playing a concert in my friend Jason's garage for his birthday. I overheard a girl say, My parents think I'm anorexic. They follow me wherever I go. In addition to guitar, I banged on pots and pans and other stuff, and even played a tape of a lawnmower. My parents think I'm anorexic. They follow me wherever I go. Little White was my L song. I wrote it on November 23rd and 24th in the trailer that I was living in while attending school. 
I called it Little White because I thought it sounded like a song by the band Big Black, who I thought were pretty cool. I had to leave my original pick for the L song, Let My Sister Go to Kennywood, off so that I'd have room to put Little White on. But that just ended up on my next tape. Little White was also one of the music videos that I made later, on April 21st, 1989. The last song on side one of the tape is Mmm, Taste Buds. November 6th was my second day in Ohio going to school, and I made a comment about my new friend Tom's Taste Buds. He asked me if I'd write a song called Taste Buds. I immediately wrote the riff, and then about a month later I wrote the words. Taste Buds! By that time, I'd come up with a new T song, so Taste Buds got changed to Masseyville Taste Buds. Masseyville was the name of the town where we were living. I thought that was stupid, though, so eventually the title became Mmm. Ed Agogo convinced me that we should include a version of our cover of Herman's Hermit's Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter that we'd done at our concert. So that became a bonus track, and side one finished up with a bunch of the profound Chuck poems that my friends and I wrote together in the trailer. On July 7th, 1988, at about 10.30 in the morning, I was working at my job, and my mind was suddenly flooded with lyrics. I had to wait until lunch to have a chance to write them down, which I did on this brown packaging paper, and then I stuffed it into my sock. I didn't have any pockets. Michel de Nostradam was a 16th century physician known for his prophecies. Most of my knowledge of him came from television shows. Nostradamus was one of three songs recorded completely in the trailer in Ohio. In fact, I recorded it in the bathroom, playing Steve's 12-string guitar. They say Nostradamus is great and all-knowing, but we don't need Nostradamus to show us where we're going. One Who was an ambiguous title, though my sister wrote the song about a particular person that she didn't like. It was written on May 22, 1988, and first appeared on Othello, a tape of songs my sister and I wrote and recorded. Though we re-recorded it for now, I blow my ABCs. Back on October 12th, 1987, I filmed myself for the first time playing my new BC Rich guitar. One thing that I played was a piece of a song that I was working on called Feeling Okay Today. This song became Pretty Okay when I finished writing it in August of 1988. The solo in the song was played on a stylophone, an electronic instrument I'd gotten at a rummage sale about a year and a half earlier. This was the last song I recorded for the album. And at the beginning of the song, there's a little clip that was recorded during the making of one of my sister's tapes. As I excitedly showed her how to sing the lyrics I'd written for a song called Three Lock Blocks, my head hit the flusher of the toilet in the bathroom where we were recording. Finger toys suck! Legos mock! Nothing is good here. Oh, my head hit the flusher! Oh, oh my god, did that hurt! How? Oh, you wouldn't believe! Ow! The 17th song, Quack, was inspired by something that I saw on TV on December 14, 1988. I saw Steve Martin on The Tonight Show telling Santa that for Christmas he wanted a puppy, stationary supplies, and a duck. I told my family about this when they came to pick me up from school on December 21st, and I wrote the song in the van as my dad was driving us home. I want a duck. I want a duck for a pet. I want a duck. Sometimes in the trailer, Tom and Steve and I would just jam for hours. One song we'd play was Jammin' by Bob Marley, which Steve taught us how to play. On November 23rd, 1988, just after watching a TV airing of Star Wars, Steve started writing some reggae music, and Tom started singing about a reggae island. Whoa, reggae island. It took a lot of takes, but eventually we recorded a usable version of the song. The first song I recorded of the whole album was Spanish Studs by the Card Catalog. One day in high school, we were in the library working on a report for World Cultures. There were a couple of Mexican-American kids in our class. My friend Jeff said, 
Look at those Spanish studs by the card catalog. The don't drop the ball line came from a note that our world cultures teacher, Mr. Mazarov, wrote on our assignment sheets. I wrote the song over Memorial Day weekend, and I quickly recorded it on June 5th so I could take it into class for Jeff to hear before we graduated. For the letter T, I recorded one of my all-time classics, Tom Ate a Banana. I wrote the song with Steve in the trailer on November 18th. We'd been jamming for hours when suddenly Tom yelled, Hey, Paul, look what I'm eating. Of course, he was eating a banana. Immediately after he said it, I wrote the entire thing. It just poured right out of me. Except the line about taking off the sticker. Steve wrote that. I spent almost four hours recording the song on New Year's Eve. It was my most ambitious song yet with at least seven different tracks. I put what I learned in recording school to good use. The 21st song was Used to Bullseye Womp Rats, which I wrote on November 23rd within about three minutes of hearing Luke Skywalker say the line in Star Wars, which we were watching that night. Next up was Vinyl Spatula, which I wrote in January 1988 while trying to come up with a rhyme for Necco Wafers. As you call my name, Echo Tapers, you watch me eat my Echo Wafers. The title came from two things written in my idea book, Spatula and Vinyl Dumbbells, and I recorded it a year later on New Year's Day 1989. A few months later, on April 20th, it was another song that I made a music video for. The 23rd song on the album, Wailing the Shit Out of Guys, was inspired by a scene in the 1985 Ron Howard movie, Cocoon. Steve, who said that that scene was his favorite part of the movie, wrote the music on November 11th, and I wrote the lyrics all night long. I recorded Tom and Steve singing a bunch of parts, and then later, I had to mix them all in using my mixer. It was a lot of work, and it required a lot of fast-forwarding quickly to cue things up. The intro to the song was recorded when I was 10 years old. Now you're going to think I'm going to say a bad word, okay? And I might. In late September 1988, I was watching an episode of the Morton Downey Jr. talk show. The topic was women in love with serial killers. One of the killers they talked about was John Wayne Gacy, who was convicted of murdering 33 young men. I got so disgusted hearing about him that I got up and turned off the TV. Not long after that, I wrote the song John Wayne Gacy. When I was working on the album, I didn't need a J song, but it did need an X song, so I just changed the title to Xylo, which was the name of a keyboard sound a band we recorded had used in a studio in school. Another song that I wrote at work was Yourself, but unlike Nostradamus, by the time I got a chance to write it down, I'd forgotten the second verse. That was in July 1988. A couple months later, I wrote a new second verse and the music. Nobody else to blame but yourself. Yourself. My little brother had written something on our Merlin the Electronic Wizard toy, and when I played it over my song, I found that it fit exactly. So that became the solo. By January 2nd, I was halfway done recording the album, but I still didn't even have a song for the letter Z. That day, my friends Chris and Kurt showed up at my house, off for winter break from college. Chris walked in my room, and he got all excited when he saw my Micronauts battle cruiser. He started raving about it, and I recorded him talking. A couple days later, I added some noisy guitar behind his voice. I decided to call the song Zing, because I thought it was a real action-packed word. Sometime right before I left recording school, I came up with the title, Now I Blow My ABCs. I thought it was a much better name for the album than Dictionary for Harold. As I was completing the recording, I took the cover photo. 
It was me sitting on the floor listening to the Misfits' Walk Among Us album on a Winnie the Pooh record player. It actually didn't come out too well due to the camera flash. Ed came over on January 15th to add bongos to five of the songs, so the album is credited to Weird Paul and his band Ed A Go Go. Over the next couple days, I timed out all the songs and wrote up the credits. But the release was delayed because my mom had to use up the rest of her camera film so she could get it developed. Selling the tape was a little harder because I wasn't in high school anymore. But my friend Jason hadn't graduated yet, so he signed people up, sold the tapes, and gave me the cash. Over the next 15 years, I sold over 70 copies of the cassette. The tapes started being played on the local college station, WRCT, and about a month later, promoter Manny Thiner gave me a chance to open for one of my favorite bands, The Happy Flowers. I was excited to find that The Happy Flowers liked us and even covered my song, My Head's on Fire. They bought some of my cassettes, too. Now I Blow My ABCs was reviewed in the local zine Cubist Pop Manifesto, which said that my songwriting continued to get better and by a Washington State magazine called Snipe Hunt. This review is in the same issue as an interview with Nirvana around the time they just finished recording their album Bleach. On April 3rd, 1989, I received my official copyright for Now I Blow My ABCs. Back then it cost $10. The tape was also sold in the K Records catalog where Calvin Johnson quoted the lyrics to my song Airport. Now I finally had enough albums out to put out my own catalog, and I released the first ever Rocks and Rolling Records catalog that summer. After I made this album, I was hit with a bad case of writer's block, and some big changes were on the way before I could get through that and start to write songs again. I hope that you enjoyed the look back at the making of my third album, Now I Blow My ABCs, on its 30th anniversary. And if you did, don't forget to click on that like button down below. I'll see you soon with more memories. Thanks, YouTube.